our next speaker is Megan Novo from Iowa State University. Good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me. I don't have pockets, <laughs> so I have this fun little necklace going on. Um, I'd just like to start off by thanking the organizers of the Lehman Conference for inviting me to talk today. My name is Megan Naveau. I'm a DVM PhD student at Iowa State University. Um, I kind of try, try to take an innovative approach to solving problems in swine production with my background, which is actually in computer science and computational biology, in my current acquisition of knowledge in veterinary school. So ultimately, I aim to apply new methods to problems that have been plaguing the industry for a very long time. Today I'm going to present a project that I completed this summer, um, analyzing active surveillance for influenza A um, in swine for transmission patterns. So I'll first walk you through um, kind of an overview of the virus, followed by its clinical presentation in pigs, and then the differences between passive and active surveillance. This are two different um, demonstrations of the virus here. It's a single-stranded RNA genome, which is made up of eight gene segments that you can see here, which encode the eight proteins that make up the virus. Um, so for example, um, gene segment four encodes the hemagglutinin or the HA protein, where gene segment six encodes the neuraminidase protein. And those are both surface glycoproteins, which you can see on the surface of the virion here. Um, so ultimately, the virus replicates in respiratory Epithelium, and so that causes a necrotizing bronchitis and bronchiolitis, which clinically, most of you probably know, um, that results in cough, lethargy, and anorexia with high morbidity and low mortality. Since 2009, the USDA has had a passive surveillance system in place to monitor influenza, which is represented by this flowchart here. Basically, a veterinarian will submit a sample from pigs with influenza-like illness, and if it meets criteria on the detection PCR, then the USDA will actually fund a subtyping PCR, virus isolation, and sequencing of the HA and NA gene segments. And then those are deposited into GenBank to be available for the public. That's very useful for monitoring influenza on a national level, but sometimes if you're interested in a more comprehensive disease detection at a finer scale, you might want a different technique, which we use utilized active surveillance. So this just means you're randomly sampling a group of pigs um, at a fixed interval over a set period of time. And for example, in a 2013 study that I have a, a little segment from here, they analyzed asymptomatic pigs and found that 20% of the samples were actually positive for influenza virus. So we utilized active surveillance in order to characterize um, the contribution of vertical transmission from a sow farm to the downstream flow and what that looks like for influenza virus. We sampled flows from four different production systems from across the United States. Um, monthly for a period of 12 months, and those are represented here. I kind of worked out the details for one farm, but they're the same for all four farms that we sampled. We sampled the groups of piglets twice, once in the sow farm when they're two to three weeks old, and a second time in the nursery when they're six to nine weeks old. So that sow farm we're sampling is actually staying the same across the entire study whereas the nursery will change based on the placement of the pigs. Um, so these samples were pooled and we performed PCR on them and the ones that were positive for influenza were submitted for whole genome sequencing, which the results of are quantified here. We ended up with at least 60 whole genome sequences and these fall into a variety of HA in NA genetic clades. Ultimately, there were six HA clades represented here, with the most common being the H1 pandemic clade, and five 
in A clades, with the most common being the N2-2002 clade. So what we did after that is where a little bit of the computational analysis comes into play. We formed um, time-scaled phylogenetic trees with the HA sequences that we got from these viruses. And that's what you're seeing here. And once we form the tree, which is important because it gives us information about the nodes, which if you're not familiar, are these little spots in between the lines going all the way back on the tree. And that's estimating the common ancestor between these viruses that we actually have shown on the tips here. And so we get that information of those common ancestors. And then we label the tips based on where we detected those sequences and we use ancestral state reconstruction to then say, based on knowing where this was located on the tip and knowing that we've estimated the uh, common ancestor, where was that common ancestor located? And so that helps us answer questions about, is vertical transmission like uh, actually contributing to the spread of influenza? And so if you follow this tree from the root here, you can see that this virus is just in the control population. So it's in US swine production in general. And then beginning, if you look at this node here, which is um, around 2019, we see that the history of this virus is that it enters farm A's south farm, which then if you follow the backbone of this green coloring, we're seeing that it stays in their south farm. But anytime you see it change to yellow, that's a detection of that traveling from the south farm to a nursery. And so we see that pattern occurring multiple times with that virus staying in the cell farm and having four introductions into the nursery. Similar pattern here for farm B. That's specifically for the H11Bs. We can look at it on the H3 tree as well, which is just a different section of viruses. It's a little more complicated, not as clean to look out, but that um, pattern is still present here in the cluster 4As but it's not present here in the 2010.1s, which could be a variety of things. It's more inconclusive. It could be that there's lateral transmission, or it could be that we, the prevalence, especially on the south farm of influenza, was just so low that we didn't detect it on the south farm in order to kind of prove that direct transmission. This is a group of H11A viruses, which is complicated because it includes the human pandemic 2009 lineage viruses. And so now in this tree, you have to include sequences from human seasonal H1N1 as well. This one, we're still figuring out the transmission pattern once it's in pigs, but kind of an incidental finding is all of these black Xs representing a unique human to swine spillover event just within these four farms that we sampled in a period of 12 months. So that's a lot. And if you extrapolate that to the entire you know, US swine production, that's more than we would have expected from our passive surveillance results that we get on a national level. Additionally, we were able to map uh, the diversity onto the HA trees. And based on the branch length, you can come up with a measure for phylogenetic diversity. And because these differ between the four farms, it says that there's farm level factors that are influencing the diversity that you have in your influenza A population. And that means ultimately there might be things you can change about how you're um, running a farm in order to reduce that. So in summary, we did 12 months of active surveillance. We found 60 whole genome sequences. We detected that um, detection in the south farm was predictive of transmission to the nursery in three out of the four of the farms. We identified those seven unique human to swine transmission events and also differences in phylogenetic diversity. We'd like to keep going, especially with that H11A clade, and also evaluate those management factors that are mutable that we could change and actually make an impact. I'd like to thank my advisors and our funding agencies and open the floor for any questions. Thank you, Megan. Any questions for Megan? Yeah, has this been published yet or will it, is it going to be published? Yeah, so the question was about publishing. We, we will publish it when I find some time. Okay, thanks. <laughs>
Um, great presentation. How much do you think your results were affected because you sequence from a pooled sample? To some degree, a lot. So uh, the reason on this slide where I say at least 60 whole genome sequences, be it's whole genome sequences is because it's much harder to reconstruct those whole genome sequences from a pooled sample than it is from a virus isolate. So we had pooled samples where there were actually like two or three different viruses in the sample. And so when we get the whole genome sequence back by gene segment, then you're trying to say, okay, this one goes with this one, and this one goes with this one. And sometimes that's very obvious and sometimes it's not. And so that definitely affects the analysis. Does that answer your question? Yes, and the diversity table that you show, is yeah. that for HA or that was for what gene of the virus? Yep, so the top one's for HA, broken into H1 and H3, and the bottom's for NA, so N1 and N2. Okay, great. Um, your human uh, strain spillover events, <clears throat> are you concluding that it came from the humans? working in the farm or could it come in through an isolation group or how do you determine that it was yeah truly so from humans the the way you're forming the relationship is we when we did the analysis we put in a bunch of just sequences from GenBank a random selection of sequences from that year and so our best guess based on what this t is telling us is that it was actually from a worker in the farm. There were no sequences from what we sampled that were any more similar to the virus than what we had from the, the random human data that we stuck into this analysis. So that's our conclusion based on what we see. Another question about the human spillover events. So what, um, what farm type were those detected in? And then also, did they appear to be kind of self-limiting, or was there any indication that any of those went into other pigs? That's an awesome question. So she asked about what the farm type was, and were they self-limiting? Um, we can kind of see here, this one was ultimately into a nursery, 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 sow farm, nursery, nursery, sow farm. So mixed. But then also they are pretty self-limiting, which is why we're not detecting them with passive surveillance at a national level. So this is a much more accurate count of those, but the relative importance if they're not transmitting further is, is up to interpretation. Thank you. A great presentation. My next question is somewhat open-ended, but do you think there would be merit now that you have a sow farm and a nursery base to go ahead and start to get finishing data? Absolutely. And I think we're gonna wrap this up. Thank you, Megan.